This audio is brought to you by Muslim Central. Please consider donating to help cover our running costs and future projects by visiting www.muslimcentral.com forward slash donate. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala hama ba'd. Uh, it's been a while since I've done a library chat. Um, I also have to uh, inform you that um, a little bit under the weather for the last uh, week. Uh, my voice is um, not going to be as energetic and enthused as it usually is. Alhamdulillah, it's not uh, COVID-related. Alhamdulillah, it's just the seasonal flu. We got that tested. Uh, so uh, still, I wanted to just do something. It's been a while since I've actually um, uh, updated my library chats. And also, it's a topic that uh, I hope will, inshallah, generate more uh, interest and uh, lead to more research on uh, on, on all of your parts. Uh, today's um, library chat is going to be uh, atypical. It's going to be different. Uh, this is going to be more like Professor Yasser and not the Sheikh side of my lectures. You're going to hear uh, a topic and certain you know, facts and whatnot that typically would not really be taught in an Islamic uh, uh, seminary or in a madrasa setting, uh, and yet still is a part of our heritage or tradition. In other words, today's topic is not Islamic as much as it is Muslim related. Uh, it is regarding one of the greatest minds that uh, our civilization has produced, and that is uh, the famous mind of Abu Rayhan Muhammad ibn Ahmed al-Bayruni, uh, or al-Biruni, both of those pronunciations are, are, are given. And uh, al-Bayruni died 440 Hijra, so literally uh, a thousand years ago from now, around a thousand plus years ago, uh, corresponding to 1048 uh, CE. And al-Bayruni, for the rest of the lecture, I'll be saying Al-Bayruni, but just realize some say Al-Bayruni. Uh, Al-Bayruni is really one of the most amazing minds that our Islamic civilization, in fact, the world has ever produced. He is truly perhaps the first of the great polymaths of uh, intellectual sciences in the history of the Ummah. And as I said, even in global history, uh, he is well known. And his interests are extremely wide and varied. You know, these types of individuals, they no longer exist. Uh, those that can contribute, uh, he contributed in mathematics, in astronomy, in philosophy, in linguistics, in anthropology, in history. Uh, his, fam his famous work on India, which we're going to talk about in a, in a little bit of detail, mineralogy, pharmacology. I mean, the, the disciplines go on and on. He was also a traveler, and he wrote about his travels and journeys as well. And uh, in fact... Um, some have compared him to uh, Leonardo da Vinci in the Western world that we had Al Bayruni, you know, uh, uh, 700 years before uh, da Vinci uh, existed or 500 years before uh, da Vinci. And uh, he is a person truly that is worthy of much study. Unfortunately, he is underappreciated uh, by many Muslims. They don't even know who he is. They have, some have heard of his names and whatnot, but truly this is a mind that as soon as the first time I heard of him and of his book about India, I was fascinated by it. And then the the more I studied, uh, this is a person that deserves a lot more than just one uh, lecture. He wrote over 140 books. Only around 30 of those um, survive in our time. Some of them are still in manuscript uh, form. And his earliest book, he wrote it when he was 17 years old. And it was his attempt to talk about uh, the calendars of the globe. Different you know, civilizations are using different uh, calendars. He wrote that when he was 17 years old. And he wrote, as I said, over 140. Uh, and uh, in fact, uh, his most famous book uh, is about India, and it is printed in over 600 uh, pages. It is also translated to English uh, by Edward uh, Sakhau. Uh, over 120 years ago, he translated into English, but it's um, it's not the best translation, but you can find it free online. You can just Google it. By the way, there is a valley on the moon named after Al-Bayruni, uh, a crater, I should say, and there's also a comet named after uh, Al-Bayruni. So his impact is beyond just our civilization, the world, scientists, they all know who he is. He also was, excuse me, he was also was um, the person who was the most accurate in estimating the radius of the earth. And we'll talk about that today, inshallah, in today's lecture as well. Since the time of the ancient Greeks, no one even came close uh, to Al-Bayruni. Al-Bayruni was far more precise uh, for many, many uh, centuries. So who is this master 
uh, literally a mastermind, literally. Who is this polymath and what do we know about him? And what are some of the benefits we can derive from his life? And again, remember, and I'm going to give, give this disclaimer, today's lecture is not coming from a purely Islamic paradigm. It's coming from a Muslim paradigm. Al-Bayruni is not a faqih. He's not an alim in the traditional sense. He's not a mufassir. He's not an aqadi expert. He's not somebody who's written any books on the Islamic sciences. All of his sciences and all of his books are about uh, disciplines of the humanities and of uh, basically the, the natural sciences. And also there's some interesting points about his life that again we're going to talk about. And this leads us to the issue of Muslim civilization, which is different than the Islamic sciences. Islamic civilization, uh, that which we're rightfully proud of, we're very proud of what the Muslim world has done. You know, we boast, and it is true by the way, that the Muslim world was the superpower for over a millennia. Over a thousand years, our civilization was the dominant superpower. When Europe was in the Dark Ages, when we had no competition uh, with any other civilization, alhamdulillah, our civilization was the most powerful. Our decline only began relatively recently. Three, four hundred years ago is when the, the, the tide began to change. But see, the awkward question we're going to raise here, and again, remember, this is Professor Yasser speaking today and not from the Sheikh side of things. The awkward question we're going to raise here is that that civilization, some would say that this comes at a cost. And that's what we're going to talk a little bit about uh, today. Some meaning of the more religious side. Because again, remember, uh, well, we'll get there inshallah. So very quickly, who is Al-Bayruni? All of this stuff you can look up. Uh, Al-Bayruni was born in 973 uh, CE in what is today uh, Uzbekistan. And uh, back in then it was called the province of Khawarizm. Uh, and he was born in the uh, the capital of the province. And he was born in one of the suburbs of the city. And the suburbs is called Birun or Beirun. It's a Farsi word meaning uh, far away. So Birun. Uh, he was born in Birun of the su of the suburbs of the capital of Khawa of Khawarizm, and of course, this is the same province within the same era and generation that has produced a very diverse group of thinkers. You've had Al Khawarizmi, the father of algebra, right? Uh, um, uh, sorry, not algebra. Al Khawarizmi, the father of algorithms. Uh, Hayyan ibn Jabal is the father of algebra, but Khawarizmi, Khawarizmi did contribute to algebra, by the way. Uh, you also have Imam Al Bukhari from the same region, and roughly a little bit before. You also have Imam Al Maturidi. Uh, coming from this region and roughly the same time frame. So you have all of these eclectic, diverse figures here. Very interesting mix, right? Somebody in mathematics, somebody who is a scholar of hadith, somebody who is a scholar of a kalam branch of Sunni uh, Islam, al-Maturidi. And this shows you again this very eclectic mix, this diverse crowd of people coming. And realize this was a time in a frame when Greek thought was abandoned in Europe and it was being studied. The only place it was being studied uh, as a science and discipline was in the Muslim world. Hence, Muslim philosophers took these sciences and developed them to what they did. And for this group of people, people like Al-Khawarizmi, people like Al-Bayruni, uh, people like Ibn Sina, who also is from a similar background, uh, for this group of people, there was no dichotomy between religion and between the Greek sciences. Unlike the ulama class, who generally speaking were very skeptical, were very suspicious of the Greek sciences, you had a lot of these intellectuals who did not find any problem embracing the Greek sciences. And for them, realize the Greek sciences wasn't just metaphysics. It was natural sciences. It was logic. It was uh, uh, philosophy as well. Uh, it was the study of the natural world, astronomy, mathematics, trigonometry. All of these were coming from the same books. And remember, Aristotle didn't just write about metaphysics. Aristotle wrote about the natural sciences and about medicine and about physics and chemistry, and uh, as did so many other uh, Greek philosophers. So this group of people, Al-Bayruni is amongst them, are those who are being trained uh, according to the sciences of the time, you're going through the Quran recitation, whatnot, and then also studying the Greek sciences. Politically speaking, it's a time of great uh, disunity. Again, unlike what some of the simple minds like to imagine, the reality is that the Muslim world, you know, has almost always been fragmented. Yes, there was one caliphate, but the the reality again is that on the ground, uh, there were dozens at any given time. There were dozens of mini dynasties. The Islamic world was more akin. To to a federation than it was to a unified uh, caliphate. Some of these federates were pretty much independent, some of them were semi, and some of them were more subservient. And so what you have are semi-independent kingdoms or dynasties that are connected by 
a, a general culture of Islam. The culture, the ethos is all Islam, but politically they are not uh, united. And uh, this was also a time when the rulers of each of these provinces, the kings, because they were kings that passed down from father to son. You can call them governors, but in reality, in effect, they had ultimate power. The Khalifa did not and could not intervene uh, within the local region of where these dynasties rule, generally speaking. And each one of these uh, dynasties, each one of these powerhouses, they wanted to impress, they wanted to, to boast about uh, what they had done. And so there was always an entourage of eclectic people, uh, viziers, scientists, poets, you know, people of arts, you know, uh, people of, of intellect, uh, and of course, sometimes scholars as well, uh, that were financed by the court. And Al-Bayruni became one of those people who was associated uh, for most of his life uh, with that, that entourage, where uh, the royal court financed him. The royal court basically paid for his salary and allowed him to do what he was doing because they wanted credit for what he had done. And so in these cultural wars between uh, the courts, between the dynasties, uh, actually we, we as a civilization uh, benefited. So as a young man, Al-Bayruni started off with the Khawarizm, Khawarizm Shah uh, dynasties. He was used as an ambassador. He was sent uh, to neighboring uh, non-Muslim regions. He, was, he also visited the actual Khalifa uh, in Baghdad. Uh, however, his story really begins for us when his dynasty that he was a part of was taken over was gotten rid of by Mahmoud al-Ghaznavi a very famous uh, uh, person and one of the main icons of the Ghaznavid uh, dynasty Mahmoud al-Ghaznavi invaded uh, Khawarizm basically where uh, where um, al-Bayruni was and uh, got rid of that dynasty and conquered that region and then took the intellectuals of that court and well, put it put to put it nicely kidnapped them i mean forcibly abducted them you know and brought them to his court in Ghazna uh, and then of course paid them a stipend and whatnot so Mahmoud uh, sorry Mahmoud al-Ghaznavi took Bayruni from Uzbekistan from Khawarizm and brought him to what is now Afghanistan and of course in the process of course this uh, helped Bayruni develop other ideas interact with other people and of course it also allowed him as we're going to talk about to go to uh, to India eventually. Uh, so Mahmoud al-Ghaznavi brought him to what is now Afghanistan uh, and uh, Ghazna. It's called the area of, of Ghazna and he remained in Ghazna until he died. The next two rulers also paid for al-Bayruni. Uh, very very quickly before I move on uh, from the theological side because again that is an area that I'm interested in. Uh, it's difficult to classify al-Bayruni. Al-Bayruni is neither a pure Sunni Ash'ari nor is he a Mu'tazili. He's kind of sort of, you know, I mean there are even phrases that some have said he's Shi'i uh, but in reality if you read his writings and again I'm open to be you know these are all views feel free to give your views as well from what I have read I believe he is unclassifiable he is an independent thinker there are certain phrases that seem to be Ash'ari there are certain phrases that are definitely Mu'tazili and there are certain phrases that might even be philosophical in nature and there are even phrases that have been interpreted to be Shi'i he praises for example uh, the, that he says there must be an Imam for example even though he wasn't you know from a Shi'i background Ground. So again, this is very interesting here, but I think that he's basically an independent thinker and various groups have claimed him to be one of their um, own. Well, except for the Athadis, he was never, uh, he, he clearly is not on that um, uh, understanding still. Nonetheless, and, and also he's not pro-Hadith as well, by the way. Clearly, he, there are, when you read his writings, there is a bit of a dismissal. For example, um, I remember one, one, uh, one issue of his that when he came across the Hadith, uh, that uh, which by the way even in Sunni tradition it has generated a lot of discussion and I don't want to go there in this lecture but that's interesting you should look this up the famous hadith of uh, allegedly again because according to Bayruni well he's not a scholar but still I'm speaking here as a historian today Al-Bayruni did not view this hadith to be authentic which hadith is this the one in which uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam comes across the Jews uh, the Yehud of Medina uh, celebrating on the 10th of Muharram and he says we have more right to this celebration than, than, than you do and then and of course, he instituted the fast on the tenth of Muharram uh, for the saving of Fir'aun. Uh, sorry, the saving of Musa from Fir'aun. Um, now, Al-Bayruni, on the basis of his calculations of 
uh, uh, the calendars, he states that the Jewish uh, festival of the Passover, the Jewish festival of being saved, could not have occurred on the 10th of Muharram in that year. And so he says this hadith is not authentic. And again, I mean, again, I'm just narrating to what Bayruni uh, is doing. It's not, obviously, we're not talking about hadith sciences in this uh, lecture. But overall, he's skeptical of hadith. And in my readings, he rarely, rarely mentions hadith in the first place. So clearly, he's not uh, coming from an athari uh, paradigm. Um, what are some of the main works of Al-Bayruni? Al-Bayruni has many works, as we said. I'll summarize maybe four or five of them. What I want to talk about is his main book, book which is one him made him famous, and that is his book on uh, India. But he has written a number of treatises. Of them is that he has a, a series of questions, a back and forth, 18 questions with Ibn Sina. Uh, Al-Bayruni and Ibn Sina most likely did meet. We are not 100% certain if they actually met uh, or did they just correspond. They're, they're contemporaneous and they're in you know neighboring regions. It's very likely that they met as well. And uh, Ibn Sina was senior to Al-Bayruni. And Al-Bayruni is writing him a series of questions and he is corresponding with him. And uh, it's interesting when you read these questions that Al-Bayruni is more skeptical of certain Greek uh, philosophers than Ibn Sina. And he is more willing to challenge some of the notions that Ibn Sina is accepting. For example, in one of these questions, um, uh, Al-Bayruni challenges this notion. The Greeks had mentioned that when an object shrinks, uh, when an object cools down, it shrinks. And Al-Bayruni objected and said, well then why does a glass of water crack when it freezes? Why does a glass of water clack, crack when it freezes? Water expands. And so he's quoting the well-known example that, hey, not everything shrinks when it gets colder. Aristotle also, for example, said that planets must move in a pure circle. Al-Bayruni objects to this and says that the notion of a circular motion of the heavens is incorrect and that it actually appears to be elliptical. Right then, the planets and the stars appear to be elliptical, and Ibn Sina is forced to admit that Al Biruni might actually be correct and Aristotle be wrong. So Al Biruni is challenging Aristotle through Ibn Sina. So again, shows you again this the the mind that he has here, uh, and and by the way, again, so this is you know the professor speaking here. Remember, Ibn Sina is no. Uh, how should I put this nicely? <laughs> Even if I'm speaking as a professor, all of my critics are still going to be from one paradigm. Uh, Ibn Sina is not viewed with uh, with a lot of compassion in scholarly circles. Remember, a century and something later, Al-Ghazali is going to come and basically say Ibn Sina is a kafir. Uh, and I'm not challenging that. Again, I'm just this is a factual lecture here. Al-Ghazali is going to come and say anybody who says these views, his head should be cut off. That's literally the verdict, right? Uh, Ibn Taymiyyah is also totally not sympathetic to Ibn Sina. Uh, Al-Bayruni is very sympathetic. Al-Bayruni is looking to Ibn Sina as a senior, as a scholar, and going back uh, and forth. And so clearly, Al-Bayruni is not on the same wavelength. And that's one of the main points of today's lecture. Islamic civilization, uh, Muslim civilization versus, you know, Islamic idealism, right? This is the uh, one of the main points I wanted to bring across here. Uh, another book, of, so this is one, one book. It's called the As-Sila Wal-Ajwaba, the Q&A. Is called and it's printed. You can find this. Uh, I think there's a dissertation done on this as well somewhere. Uh, another book that he wrote is called Al Athar Al Baqiya An Al Qurun Al Khaliya, uh, the remnants uh, of the previous uh, civilizations. And he wrote this when he was very young, in his early twenties. And this talks about um, uh, it's an exercise in, in chronography. Uh, he talks about uh, the histories of the previous nations, and he he has always been very interested in time and in calendars, and in the movement of the stars, astronomy. And so in this book, he talks a lot about the calendars of other civilizations and how the religious uh, festivals of the Zoroastrians, uh, of the, uh, the some of they call the Solgians, the Khawarizmians, uh, the Yehud, the Christians, how are they uh, calculated? And uh, in this book as well, he talks a lot about the prayer timings uh, as well. And there's another book of this complementary, and it is called Shadows or Avlal. And so in these two books, both of them, he actually discusses uh, how to calculate prayer timings from the uh, shadows and it is one of the most unique books ever written the book on shadows for example the, the one that he has here and he goes into a lot of detail about the movement of the sun and how it affects the shadows and he says that uh, time and calculating time is fundamental to man's existence and within this work he then goes into a lot of detail this is perhaps the only time he discusses a little bit of fiqh and he only discusses it 
meaning as a student, he doesn't actually prescribe fiqh, but he summarizes the fiqh details of the various schools of law, not just the four Sunni schools, by the way, but the positions of the Karamis, the Tahiris, the Shia. And again, he's bringing all of these schools and the timings that uh, they have. Now, what is interesting here, it's going to be one of the first points of today's lecture that I want you to think about, is that he strongly criticizes certain segments of the ulama class who appear to have attacked him okay because uh here's the point al-bayruni clearly was under a lot of pressure from the scholarly class the ulama uh did not like him for multiple reasons and uh in his books now we don't have treatises that they wrote against him we do have his defense of himself against these people uh, unnamed people who they are and this is one of them here is that he has been attacked, apparently by reading his book here, he has been attacked uh, for trying to deduce prayer timings uh, from uh, astronomy, okay, from principles of science. And scholars have attacked him for trying to derive equations, basically for deriving prayer timings. And so he's defending himself in this book. And he takes on these critics of his. And he says that if you really want to calculate the prayer timings, you're going to have to study the works of Euclid and the al Majest of Ptolemy. And he mentions these by name. He's literally mentioning this by name. Uh, and uh, he, 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 he is exasperated at uh, the ulama who have a disdain of the field of astronomy and of trigonometry and he is saying that look this is you you're going to have to go down this route if you want to calculate the prayer timings and you cannot just sit there and observe the shadows every single day you can easily estimate uh, the prayer timings of any uh, any locality if you you know basically study these these basic sciences and he then uh, rather harshly criticizes them and he says anybody who doesn't go down this route uh, they should, he literally says either just sit down and let us do our job you know or else you are like the awam you're like the the people who have no knowledge so he, you can sense this harshness that he has against the religious clergy who don't want him to study uh, the basic principles of uh, astronomy and of the movement of the sun thinking that these sciences are uh, going to lead to a very evil avenue uh, he actually says he criticizes in this book he criticizes uh, ulama who he calls muqallidun they're just following blindly following what they've been taught and they're not willing to go beyond what they have uh, memorized what their teachers have uh, told them and he says to them that they need to study these sciences otherwise he says that they're not uh, the, the notion that these sciences are going to lead uh, to kufr he goes this is simply wrong and then he has a passage here. I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, quote the passage here this is straight from his uh, from his book that he says that um, when they are told to study these sciences he says that this adds to the revulsion of this alim so he so uh, what he does is he puts his fingers into his ears to stop any noise from coming in. And that becomes his strongest weapon to counter my argument. And he raises his voice in shouts and that becomes his most powerful equipment to silence me. So Al-Bayruni is clearly irritated at a group of ulama, we don't know who they are, at a group of ulama who are accusing him of kufr, and he's saying all you guys can do is shut yourselves out and scream your accusations. You're not going to benefit, he goes, if you don't go down this 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 um, avenue. Uh, and of course, uh, his anger is palpable. You can sense it here. Uh, and he literally, like I said, he literally says, if you're not going to join in this, in this uh, science, then just sit down and let us do our job let the experts do the job uh, and of course this tension here it still exists to this day i have to say one part of me is very sympathetic to al-bayruni in this tension between uh, the rational sciences and between the religious sciences it's a standard it's been there done that again if you don't study history you're doomed to repeat it right so the same people who criticize al-bayruni and they're, they're the ones using the prayer charts these days right so the point being that it's human nature that it's it's going to happen a thousand years ago we find this tension uh that we still find to this day and the levels of compromise on each side is a constant negotiation. Um, another book of Al-Biruni that he wrote for the Ghaznavid the ruler uh, named after him, he called it Al-Qanun Al-Mas'udi. And this is a, a very detailed astronomical book uh, that talks about the movement of the stars, the celestial objects, and also lays out the latitudes and the longitudes of the major cities of the time frame. And it is highly accurate. You can still check it to this day. And it was written for the ruler of the Ghaznavids of his uh, 
uh, time frame. Also, he wrote a number of books uh, that laid the foundations of modern pharmacology. Um, and uh, as well, uh, he actually also has uh, a book on, believe it or not, astrology, not astronomy, astrology. And uh, in this book, he summarizes some of the main madhahib of astrology. And uh, you can tell he's skeptical of some of them. Nonetheless, he, he is affirming some aspects of astrology. Because again, at that time frame, astronomy and astrology are interlinked, interlinked together. We have separated them in our times and saying one of them is a natural and one of them is metaphysical. But in his time frame, the two were intertwined uh, together. So uh, that is an interesting point that again, we're going to come back to this point as well. Is that you're not going to get somebody like Al-Biruni without a little bit of a quote-unquote compromise. Uh, also, he, he calculated um, the circumference and the radius of the earth uh, standing somewhere on a mountain in modern-day Punjab in Pakistan, which we'll talk about as well, surprisingly accurate. Now, his most famous book, which is the book that really is the most fascinating to me, it was how I first heard of him uh, 20-something years ago. Uh, as a student in Medina, the first time I heard of Al-Biruni, uh, somebody just mentioned this to me and I, I looked up the book and, and ever since then I've, I've been very fascinated with this with this character, even though of course I, I haven't studied him in detail, I've just perused over his writings and read his biography and whatnot. Um, his most famous book, uh, and really it is the most fascinating, is his work on India. The title of it is كتاب تحقيق ما للهندي من مقولة مقبولة في العقل أو مرذولة. Very interesting title, and that is the uh, the verifying of uh, what India has of uh, ideas that are acceptable to the intellect or ideas that are rejected by the intellect. And some have called this book to be the first book of anthropology ever. Uh, written and in this book he chronicles the peoples and the lives and the times and the beliefs and the systems of India that he himself observed and he interacted with and one of the most important contributions that he made was that he discussed this book and the ideas in it from what we would call a neutral perspective remaining as a Muslim obviously but he tried his best to be fair and he tried his best to be uh, balanced he didn't just concentrate on the politics and on the politicians he talked about the lives and the beliefs of the people of uh, India now story of this book is interesting uh, he was, of course, by this time living in Ghazna uh, uh, with the Ghaznavids. Um, and Mahmoud al-Ghaznavi uh, decided to invade India. Now, by the way, pause here, footnote. This is a very, very interesting story that deserves its own series of lectures. How Mahmoud's invasion of India is interpreted by, let's say, the extremist Hindus like the BJP and how it's interpreted by, let's say, the Muslims, the Pakistanis, let's say. Very interesting. The same story and you can have a parallel narrative as if they're two completely separate stories. So Mahmoud al-Ghaznavi's invasion of India uh, and conquest of certain portions of India, which is now Pakistan, by the way, what he has done is basically uh, most of Pakistan. So Mahmoud al-Ghaznavi is, view is viewed as a liberator and as a, one of the, f the intellectual founders, let's say, of Islam in India. Uh, and of course, uh, the BJP and, and the other movements, they view him as being an invader and, and whatnot. Nonetheless, that's not the, the topic of today. Mahmoud al-Ghaznavi decides uh, to invade India. And he takes, uh, why does he do so, by the way, some, again, lots of story. Let's not go there. Uh, and he um, takes with him uh, our own guy, Al-Bayruni. And so Al-Bayruni, firsthand, one of the greatest minds of his time frame, he enters the lands of India and he intermingles with the uh, people and he learns Sanskrit. By the way, Bayruni was not just a polymath, he was multilingual. He spoke at least five to seven languages fluently, including ancient Hebrew, now Sanskrit, Greek. Uh, he studied all of these languages. Uh, of course, he, studied, he spoke his own local Khawarizmian language along with that Farsi and along with that Arabic. So he is like speaking five or six or seven uh, languages. And he learned Sanskrit in India. And he then uh, acquired some of the most original uh, um, books of the ancient uh, Hindu systems and the Vedic uh, beliefs. And he also interacted with pundits and absorbed the culture. We don't know how long he stayed in India, perhaps at least a year or so. He stayed in India and he then wrote this book based upon his own uh, experiences. And uh, in the beginning of the book, he begins the book by defending the fact that he's writing it. Because once again, he's been criticized. You can tell he is constantly having to defend himself 
against his religious critics. His critics are typically in his books. We find them to be of the religious side. And he begins his book by defending the need to write this book. And he says that it is important to mention the truth even if it is against an enemy. And he quotes the verse in the Quran, وَلَوْ عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِكُمْ And he mentions how rare it is for a scholar to describe an opposing opinion without reading in his own bias, without going beyond just the uh, description. And he cites a really interesting example that I myself can say that I have heard with my own two ears. The same example. And he says, for example, how it is that when a Sunni speaks of the Mu'tazili creed that he and he goes he this doesn't happen to him he mentions the name of so and so the Sheikh so and so that he's studying you know with a certain Sheikh and the Sheikh says the Mu'tazila say that Allah does not have any knowledge they deny that Allah has knowledge and uh, Al Bayruni says I corrected the Sheikh and I said no that's not what the Mu'tazila say the Mu'tazila say that Allah knows with a knowing that is His essence in other words he is saying you have interpreted this phrase to mean that Allah does not have knowledge. That's not what the Mu'tazila say. That is your derivation of what they say. That is your accusation of what the Mu'tazila say. And this is a key point because again, even when I first heard about the Mu'tazila, that's how our scholars talk about them. That the Mu'tazila deny Allah has knowledge. And if you actually read a Mu'tazili, they would never say that. It's just the way that they phrase it and how we derive what we derive and how they derive what they derive. So the point being that he mentions this example in his uh, in his uh, muqaddimah and he says that he wants to do justice to the truth and explain the reality of the civilization of India uh, without being just a critic. He doesn't. He he, he makes a very uh, you know a very uh, passionate plea that it's his job to present the truth. And he actually writes, and I quote from the Muqaddimah: "Lan min ajli dahdiha. I am not going to present the arguments of my opponents." in order to refute them because that's not the way that I want to do this book kitabi la yazidu an kawnihi sijillan tarikhiyan li haqaiq my book it is basically a registrar a historic registrar of the truth it's going to record what they say sa'ad'u bayna yadayl qari'i nadhariyat al-hindus kama hiya bilzabt this is a very key phrase i'm going to put the ideas of the hindus in front of the reader as they are I'm going to narrate, and this is exactly what they believe. And as I said, this book has been translated and is freely available online. You can just do a Google, PDF, Google, and it's been translated by Edward uh, Sachau, Edward, S-A-C-H-A-U, Edward, S-A-C-H-A-U. And... In this book, he discusses the types of Hinduism, the beliefs of the Hindus, the rituals, the intellectual life, metaphysics, the concept of the soul, the philosophy of, of, of the people there, the caste systems in a lot of detail, the cosmology, uh, the notion of transmigration of the soul. He compares Hinduism with the beliefs of the ancient Greeks, cr- uh, cross-cultural examination between you know Hinduism and, and the ancient uh, Greeks. And the point here is that he is treating Hinduism and the people of India as a civilization that needs to be described in detail. It doesn't just dismiss it as, oh, this all, you know, paganism and shirk and idolatry, even though, of course, at some level it is. But it's not that simplistic, i.e. there's a lot more to it as well. And it's also interesting, by the way, he claims, and again, I'm just quoting what he says, he claims that pure Hinduism, as practiced by the real practitioners and the pundits of the faith, is monotheistic. And he says that it is the awam of the Hindus or the, you you know, the, the masses who mistakenly have taken the idols and or whatnot. So, you know, and again, he's not a Hindu and he doesn't accept Hindu theology. He is a Muslim. You can find phrases in there very clearly where he says Alhamdulillah and this and that. But when it's coming to describing the peoples of the land, he adopts a neutral stance. And it's really interesting, this book, because... It is actually extraordinary that he would even want to do something like this, especially because there's no evidence that uh, that Mahmoud al Ghaznavi asked him to do this. He actually did this on his own. He did this on his own. He wanted to do this, and uh, even clearly, he's a believing Muslim. And at times he'll criticize certain aspects of the faith. So by the way, he says he's never going to do that. Sometimes he does. But in reality, when he explains about the cultures and the rituals and the caste system and the beliefs, he's not writing in a sarcastic manner. There's really no vulgar adjectives. There's no dismissal. In fact, he's taking them as a sophisticated civilization worthy of appreciation to a certain degree, even if he disagrees with them. And it is because of this methodology, which was way ahead of his time, you're not going to find this type of methodology, that 
uh, one of the most famous Orientalists of the last century, Arthur Jeffrey, and I've mentioned his name in my Quran book and others, very well-known person, Arthur Jeffrey. Arthur Jeffrey writes about al-Bayruni that his main contribution wasn't just scientific, but rather methodological. That al-Bayruni was one of the first, if not the first, to try to basically present an opponent's belief in a manner that would be fair and objective and completely holistic, trying to explain as a neutral uh, person. Now again, to be clear here, Al-Bayruni is a practicing Muslim. Al-Bayruni is aware that the people that he's describing are not correctly guided. But that doesn't stop him from being fair and from being factual and from trying to be uh, critically uh, neutral in his observance of what he is uh, witnessing. And by the way, uh, if particular interest uh, of al-Biruni is how uh, the people of his time, of the Indians, they calculated time. And of course, there's something called the Zinj tables. Again, that's another topic altogether. These are all things, by the way, we should all look up here. You know, um, uh, al-Majest of, of Ptolemy, for example. By the way, al-Majest, right? It's not the, the, the word al-Majest. It is an Arabicized from the ancient uh, Greek. Uh, majest is from majestic. And so Ptolemy wrote a book um, that was majestic. And the Arabs translated it and they wrote the alif lam uh, before it. And so the term al-Majest uh, of Ptolemy is actually Arabicized, and that's how it is known even to this um, to this day. Uh, and so uh, Bayruni worked a lot on those books, and he published Zinj tables. What are Zinj tables? Zinj tables are tables that talk about the celestial um, uh, stars and their particular places at particular times. Very detailed charts. So in this book on India, he benefits from the Indians' uh, astronomy as well. Now. I want to talk about uh, one other thing before our conclusion, and that is a very interesting point here uh, about calculating the radius of the Earth. And uh, this is something that is actually, inshallah, we can all understand it if you remember your high school uh, trigonometry. Uh, the first person to attempt to do so, to attempt to calculate the radius of the Earth, uh, was... Uh, uh, er, um, Eratosthenes, right? Eratosthenes, right? Correct? Eratosthenes? I think, uh, Eratosthenes, yes, 195 uh, BC, 195 BC. And uh, so that's a thousand years before uh, Al-Bayruni. And uh, Eratosthenes, he employed uh, a very ingenious method, which involved measuring the change in latitude of a celestial object measured at two far away locations on the same longitude. So if you knew the exact distance between two distant locations, you would be able to calculate the radius of the Earth based upon that. Now the problem, there were a number of problems here with um, that calculation. Uh, of them is that you would have to know the exact linear distance as the crow flies between two faraway locations, and that's very difficult to uh, translate. And so um, uh, Eratosthenes did in fact uh, attempt a calculation. Al-Bayruni was not satisfied with it. Al-Bayruni went a more accurate method that did not require as many input methods, as many measurements to make, and did not require a long distance traveling. So Al-Bayruni devised a more easier and a more precise method that had fewer possibilities of error. And Al-Bayruni's method only involved two calculations, and it involved one location. So two calculations and one location. You didn't have to travel far and wide. And that one location required a number of things. It required a mountain, and it required a plain horizon. You couldn't have a valley or whatnot. Just a mountain followed by flat earth or maybe even you know ocean or whatnot, where you could see the horizon straight from the mountain uh, top. That is all that is uh, required. And so al -Bayru, and, and you need only two, uh, two input the first is the height of the mountain, and the second is the degree uh, of the horizon from the top of the of the mountain top. Right. So those are only two things that you need. And by the way, Al Bayruni calculated the height of the mountain very ingeniously, very uh, very simply as well. Uh, not by dropping a string or something of this nature, but rather by observing the angle of the peak from two locations, P1. So he stands at P1 and he looks at the angle of the mountain. Then he goes back to P2 and then he looks at the angle of the mountain again. And he knows the distance between P1 and P2. So he knows this distance and he knows the angles of from P1 and P2. And based upon that, he can calculate the height of the mountain H, okay, so he finds this mountain in modern modern day Pakistan. I kid you not, this took place in Pakistan, modern day Pakistan in Punjab somewhere. He finds a mountain, 
and he then calculates the height of the mountain uh, H. And uh, he does this by, as I said, a very simplistic method, simply by P1, P2, and the angles from both of these uh, localities. By the way, there's a video that somebody has attempted to do this, and I'll put that in the, the links. So let's look at the, the uh, link below. So let me now see if I can um, uh, show you uh, the sl uh, slide that I found somewhere online. This is not from me. Okay, I hope you can see this uh, slide here. I hope you can see this slide um, over here. So here's the, the uh, di diagram that somebody derived from uh, Al-Biruni's uh, writings. So remember, Al-Biruni has already calculated the height of the mountain, H, okay? And we're looking for R, the radius of the Earth, okay? Is that clear? Take a look at this diagram, understand what's going on here. Al-Biruni already knows H. He's calculated H, and now we want to calculate for R, which is the radius of the Earth. How do you do this? You go to the top of the mountain and you are now uh, basically standing at the top of the mountain and you measure the angle of the horizon. You measure the angle of the horizon from the top of the mountain, which uh, let's call it theta. Okay, so theta is the angle of the horizon. You see that very clearly from the top of the mountain. Okay, now you notice that as you're standing on the top of the mountain, you are forming a right angle triangle from the center of the earth, okay? And one of the right angle triangles is the center of the earth, right? The other is where you are, and the third is the horizon. The third is that horizon where your line of sight hits the horizon, okay? With this simple, very simple high school trigonometry, you can solve for R, why? Because cosine, as you remember, you should all remember for your basic math lessons, right? Remember, I do have a degree in mathematics, but sorry, engineering, which I have a minor in mathematics and chemistry. But yes, I did all of, I did way more than trigonometry. <laughs> I did uh, partial differentials and all of this way back in the day. That I would not be able to do. I've forgotten all of that. But yeah, trigonometry, you don't forget trigonometry once you've done as much math as I had to, to, had to do. But um, uh, cosine, of course, remember what cosine is, is adjacent over hypotenuse, right? So now take a look at this triangle here, right? So you have, in our case, uh, cosine theta. Now, by the way, theta, look at theta on the top and theta in, the, in, in, in our triangle. It's going to be exactly the same. And I hope you understand why. Because theta at the top, which is the angle that you're looking at, obviously that forms a right angle triangle. And so the angle uh, that is remaining is 90 minus theta, which happens to be exactly what the angle of our triangle down that we're interested in is going to be. And so that is theta. And so you have now, the angle that you've seen is going to be the same angle of our own right angle triangle, which is theta. So cosine theta is going to be adjacent R, the radius of the earth, over hypotenuse, which is R plus H. Okay, I hope that's clear here. So cosine theta equals R over R plus H, which is adjacent over theta. Now, remember, you know H, you've already calculated H. Okay, and you've just calculated theta by standing on the mountain. So you simply solve this equation here for R. Very simple algebra, very simple trigonometry. And you get that R is H divided by secant theta minus 1. Remember, secant is 1 over cosine or inverse cosine, or, or to be more pedantic, secant is hypotenuse over opposite, right? So again, this is all simple stuff. You can do this yourself, uh, calculate it out. Very simple, literally high school. Again, the ingeniousness is in its simplicity, right? And so you solve this equation here for R, and you get the equation that Al-Bayruni got. And so Al-Bayruni carried out this experiment, and he found out that theta was around, you know, 34 uh, degrees. And he came out, he calculated the fact that the radius of the Earth is 12 million 803,337 vira or cubits. And when you convert um, vira to meters, it's not quite precise in our times, but we get around 6,000 kilometers, around 6,000. The actual radius of the Earth is 6,372. Okay, so Al Bayruni was 300 kilometers off. That's it by this simple calculation. By the way, the Greek guy got 5,200 kilometers. He was over 1,000 kilometers off. And it would take many, many centuries to beat al-Bayruni's mechanism. So al-Bayruni here is calculating the radius of the earth via this very, very interesting interesting chart here. Okay, so now let's get back to um, uh, the, the, the lecture, lecture and conclusion. By the way, isn't that just amazing, subhanAllah? Such a simple and yet you know elegant way of doing this. Excuse me here. <clears throat> my voice needs some, my throat needs some water here. Now, I want to conclude off here. 
again, much can be said. Please read up on Al Bayruni. I'm not going to be, you know, uh, my point is really this conclusion is the main point to introduce you to this fascinating individual and then to cause you to think about something. Brutally honest question. Knowing what you know, which is very little after this one lecture, go beyond this. Do you believe that our Ummah benefited from the likes of Al Bayruni? I mean, I think we did. He didn't produce anything about fiqh or aqidah or tafsir that was in his discipline. But you see, here, here's the difficult point here, right? And again, I know my critics are going to go and start releasing their videos and PDFs and scrib notes and whatnot, but it needs to be said here. In order for a civilization to flourish, in order for an ummah to be a superpower, in order for us to have bragging rights that we do for our previous histories, we can't just expect ulama to produce their books. You see, a civilization, a civilization is more than just religious clergy. You need genuine intellectual curiosity. You need exploring. You need research. And the people who do this and excel at it are typically not the same groups that are studying fiqh and theology and tafsir. And in fact... Most of the time, dare I say, the rule is that those people are not bound by what orthodoxy says. Frankly, the default is that they're going to go beyond the bounds of orthodoxy. In our case, Al-Bayruni is having to tackle religious clergy pretty much all throughout his writings. You can tell he's incensed, he's irritated. You know, as far as I know, nobody called him outright a kafir or whatnot in his... Maybe they did, I don't know, it looks like that. But, you know... He, he, he wrote a book on astrology, by the way, right? And if you were to read that book, I mean, the verdict from a clergy perspective is very clear. And again, that's why I said the disclaimer at the beginning. I'm speaking to you as professor today. Today, this lecture is Professor Yasser, right? This is not the sheikh side. Uh, and I know my critics don't really care. They're all going to go berserk anyway. But I mean, this is the, 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 the side to make you think here. Is that I'm not saying it's right or wrong. I'm simply describing it as it is. No civilization is based purely on religious thought and religious clergy. Now, I'm not saying religious cler clergy don't have a major role to play. Clearly, they do. Clearly, they define orthodoxy. They define, you know, salvation. And, and you know, uh, they're the ones that are interpreting, you know, the scriptures and whatnot. And that's great. Alhamdulillah. But let us be honest here. Let's, let me push the boundaries. Take it a little bit further here. Uh, what would happen if the clergy were to have a society in accordance with their interpretations of how society should be. To put it bluntly, what would happen if the clergy were actually given political powers? If they ruled instead of the Umayyads and the Abbasids and the Samanids and the Khwarizm Shahs and the Ghaznavids and the Ilkhanids and the hundreds and thousands of political players that came and went. How different would society have looked if they had actually taken charge. Let's leave aside for now the, uh, the, the issue of, generally speaking, clergy are not qualified to run a civil infrastructure. Let's leave that aside. I'm asking you, suppose that they were to enforce their vision of what is right and wrong on the peoples, and they would implement what they thought was ideal on the entire population. What would happen to the likes of Al-Bayruni? What would happen to the likes of many of those whom we, we, we boast and we praise that these are our, our giants? I mean, again, not to get too personal here, but even this lecture, I'm sure, is going to release its own slew of, of, of critics. And people like myself are, generally speaking, far within mainstream traditionalism. And yet, my critics want to silence me. And they're trying to consider me to be a deviant. And, you know, uh, I'm telling people to think and, and not, um, you know, not spoon-feeding them what, they need, what needs to be done, etc. I mean, if somebody as mainstream and traditional, you know, like myself, is not tolerated, I'm a threat to uh, so many of, 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 of you know, uh, the, the, the trained clergy, let's say. Can you imagine people like Al-Bayruni? Can you imagine Ibn Sina? And again, let's, let's be very brutal here. What would have happened if people who sympathize with Al-Ghazali's fatwa were actually in charge when Ibn Sina and Al-Biruni and others were alive. What would have happened here? Think about that reality. Is that here we are boasting about the superpower that used to be our religion's uh, civilization. We have every right to do that. And yet, there's an underbelly that we don't like to think about. And that is, many of the people who made that civilization 
would have been viewed as heretics by those who define orthodoxy, right? Now again, I'm speaking today as professor and not to sheikh. I keep on making that disclaimer. Let me very quickly just put on my sheikh cap here, my topi, sheikh topi here, and just say, of course, it's the job of the ulama to preach the ideal. Of course, it's the role of the scholars to keep everything in theological check. We thank Allah for them. They're the inheritors of the prophets. Imagine if they didn't exist, you know, how things would have changed. So that's my topi. Let me take that topi off and say, if you really want a civilization to flourish, perhaps, perhaps it is healthy to separate the gatekeepers of orthodoxy from the actual enforcers of politics. Perhaps it's healthy that the gatekeepers of orthodoxy are relegated to writing books or in my case, releasing YouTube videos from the vans of their mothers or the basements of their fathers or whatever and writing their PDS and scrib notes. I mean, it's probably healthy that the critics are just talking and releasing videos. And perhaps we should be thankful to Allah that those very people who claim to defend the faith are not actually given authority to defend their version of the faith. Or else, what might happen if such peoples actually did have that power? And by the way, in the last decade, two or three small groups who claim to be faithful to their versions of Islam have actually come to power in various regions. We've seen what they've done. We have seen the realities, right, of what would happen when people think that they are implementing the will of God. And so here, you know, again, perhaps it's very, very beneficial that Imam al-Ghazali says that Ibn Sina committed kufr and is deserving of the death penalty, but doesn't have the power to enforce that. And Ibn Taymiyyah comes and criticizes, and alhamdulillah, we want him to do that. And again, let me really put my sheikh topi back on. Of course, we sympathize and agree with defining orthodoxy, right? That's great. And then take that cap off and say, but then what would have happened if they actually had the power to implement that? Al-Bayruni calculated the radius of the earth despite the fact that ulama of his time thought it's kufr to go down this route. You know, we can boast that Ibn Sina's canon of medicine was studied for 400 years in Europe, but he would not have been alive if certain versions of you know, fatwas were implemented. Uh, Ibn Rushd paved the way for the enlightenment. And yet, of course, his aqidah is what it is, if you know Averroes. And again, we say, Alhamdulillah, thumma alhamdulillah, for the likes of Imam al-Ghazali, and the likes of Ibn Taymiyyah, and other icons and giants of our tradition, our ulama, who are the inheritors of the prophets, who defended our deen for us, who retained the purity of our faith for us, and it is really the most important, because in the end of the day, the radius of the earth is interesting, but it is the deen in which our salvation lies. And with that intentionally cryptic and pleasantly contradictory conclusion, I conclude, Jazakumullah khair, Salaamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi. وبركاته يا من أجبت دعاء نوح فانتصر وحملته في فلكك المشحون يا من أحال النار حول خليله روحا وريحانا بقولك كون